Warren, thank you for that kind introduction. And as I was listening to you, it sounds like Wayne Budd's a guy who can't hold a job. <laughs> <clears throat> I have the honor today of introducing John Hammergren, Chairman, President, and CEO of the McKesson Corporation. John was elected President and CEO in 2001, and its Chairman in 2002. <clears throat> I've known John for over 11 years as I'm a fellow member of the McKesson Board of Directors. Under his leadership, McKesson has become the top provider of healthcare services and information technology solutions which help healthcare organizations improve their business performance and deliver better care to patients. 13 years ago, John was asked to take the top job at McKesson after the company experienced an accounting crisis related to a major acquisition. He righted the ship, and under his guidance, McKesson has tripled its revenues to nearly $138 billion per annum, expanded into global markets, advanced to number 15 on the Fortune 500 list, and has provided shareholders with 16% compounded annual interest or compounded return on their investment. There is no doubt, nor is it any real surprise, that he is one of the nation's longest tenured and most successful CEOs. John has spent his entire career in healthcare, having learned the industry from his father, a medical supply salesman in Minnesota. Mr. Hammergren is truly an American success story. After losing his father during his teenage years, he put himself through college with a variety of entry-level jobs and today leads one of the nation's largest and most successful companies. And he's an Eagle Scout to boot. <laughs> By the way, John Hammergren is not only a smart, savvy businessman, he is also one of the most competitive guys that I know whether it's in business, golf, water skiing, or even croquet, for that matter. Most importantly, I know him to be a highly ethical person of irreproachable integrity. That, together with his great sense of humor, makes him the whole package. Few people in the nation understand healthcare the way John does. I hope that you are looking forward to his remarks as much as I am. Please join me in welcoming John Hammergren to our podium. Uh, thank you, Wayne. I'm, I'm actually very surprised you read the whole thing. <laughs> my, my wife and kids worked on that over the weekend. Thanks, Wayne, for, for getting that done. I, I'm delighted to be here. I have to, have to admit I'm a bit humbled to be here. When they asked me to speak and Warren said, you know, this is going to be pretty easy. This is a, a crowd of people that you, you know, you'll know. You'll know a bunch of them, which I do, and lots of familiar faces. Even my neighbor from New Hampshire, Paul Montrone, is here. So it's exciting to see some people here that, I, that I've spent some time with and a great group of McKesson executives over here at this table. So thank you also for coming down. And you're the only ones who are actually paid to be here. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate that. But if you think about the, the challenge of speaking in a, at a group like this, um, it, it, it's quite daunting. I, I can talk about being a great CEO, but all of you are great CEOs. I can talk about uh, health care, but I've got a bunch of health care customers in the room that will probably correct me or fire me as a, as a service provider to them. Or I could talk a little bit about uh, what a great investment McKesson is, and I've got a bunch of investors that probably own our stock and can only sell it, so I want to make sure I don't do anything incorrect on that path. So I'm going to take the easy task, which is to talk a little bit about the challenges in healthcare, because healthcare is such a simple subject, don't you think? <laughs> so for those of you that are in the healthcare business uh, in the room, please uh, resist the temptation to stand up and correct me over and over and over again as I make mistakes. Because my comments are really uh, from a lens that may be different than the lens you hear many times from people that are in the healthcare system. Uh, clearly, uh, providers, uh, physicians, and pharmacists and nurses have a, a unique and an intimate perspective on the healthcare system and are, are in healthcare because they love taking care of people and they're doing a great job at, at advancing the, the quality of care in this nation. And there's a lot of people involved in the, in the system side of healthcare, the, you know, the, the people that run the great hospitals in this country and certainly here in Boston 
you're renowned for the quality of your health care and, and the system that has been built here. And those that are on the payer side that help work with employers like McKesson or work with the government and Medicare Advantage types of programs to try to rein in the cost of, of health care, provide better visibility to the participants and, uh, and, re and reduce uh, the variability. There's a lot of work underway, obviously. This is a top subject for our country and there's, there's good reason for it. If we don't change the trajectory of our spend in this country, by 2050 we will spend the entire revenue of the country on health care. That's why it's top of mind, that's why it's always a subject. I pause when I say this, but if I look around the room, many of you are actually the problem. Because the biggest consumer of health care in this country are people uh, that are in the baby boom generation that are turning 65, so I know there's a few of you that are entering that phase of your life, and you consume three to four times the amount of health care of someone that's 45 years or younger. 10,000 Americans today are joining a Medicare each day, and that burden continues to be an accelerant in terms of the spend in this country. So as much as people are trying to bend the curve, the demand for supply of health care continues to, to obviously accelerate. 75 cents of every dollar is consumed by people that have chronic diseases, 10% of our population consumes 64% of the spend, when 50% of the population consumes only 10% of the spend. Uh, so there's a, a significant challenge here as this demand bubble goes through the system, and the populations that are here to pay for it uh, have to be more and more productive to make it happen. And those of, the, of you in the room that are delivering that care uh, are faced with the burden of ever decreasing reimbursement and request to be more efficient while you have a more demanding consumer. And clearly there's innovation in the, in the healthcare industry. We should be happy that there's innovation. The most recent example of innovation is the launch of a product called Sivaldi. You might have seen it in the newspapers. It's a hep C drug. Uh, the company that launched it is being criticized for overcharging for the drug, but yet the drug in fact has made a significant difference in the life expectancy of hep C patients. In fact, will cure those patients in a matter of weeks rather than suffering with the disease for years with a, a rather expensive and traumatic end for most of those uh, hep C patients in the past. And we uh, at McKesson uh, treat about 20% of the cancer patients in the country. And I can tell you there's tremendous innovation coming along on the cancer front as well. And many of the people that would have had a 90% probability of mortality and now have a 90% probability of survival beyond a decade if they take some of the drugs that are being uh, put through the pipeline. That's great for the patient, but it's not so good for the healthcare system from an economic perspective. Another burden that we have to figure out how we're going to offset over time. So the problem is significant, the demand is real, uh, and, and the challenge for our country uh, obviously is top of mind for everyone. Clearly the, the administration and our friends in Washington and here in Massachusetts recognized these problems years ago and began to put moves in place to try to bend the cost curve and to do something about the demand for health care. I think in the state of Massachusetts you should be congratulated for the tremendous success you've had from the access point of view. I think we have nearly 98% of the adults in the, in the state covered and probably 100% of the kids uh, covered through some type of a health plan and I think that's just terrific progress. The fact that people that don't have access to health care now will get it through these exchanges and be able to shop for health care like everybody else is a, another great example of how we might get access uh, for, for more of our citizens. But even those that have that access, even subsidized access, many times can't afford uh, the health insurance premiums that they're asked for. And for those of you that are large employers like McKesson, uh, many of our employees, even with the tremendous support we give employees to get access to insurance, uh, they simply just still can't afford the premiums that they're being charged. So the problem is quite significant and, uh, and the solutions that have been put in place thus far are treating parts of the symptoms but probably are not going to fully solve the problem on the course that we're on. So the dialogue needs to continue to be in rooms like this across the country to talk about how we can change the trajectory of health care and what changes we might put in place to make a difference. The is issue of quality is often talked about as well. And in fact, some people use statistics to talk about European health care delivery systems being better than U.S. health care delivery systems because of the uh, longevity or the cost to serve the per capita cost, the percentage of GDP that's spent in those economies on health care. But being a global company like McKesson, uh, I've had an opportunity to travel in many of those markets. And I, I can assure you that if I'm going to have health care, like most of you in this room, I'm going to come back to Boston or some other great city in this country to have my health care delivered here. 
So albeit there may be some indicators that people are able to bend the cost curves in these other countries, uh, it's not evident that they can produce a better result at the end for the patients in America. And this should be top of mind for us as we think about what we're going to do from a cost perspective because the issue of access, the issue of innovation, and the issue of, of affordability all collide together when you're, issuing, when you're dealing with the issue of uh, our economy and how we're going to withstand the pressure that we're under. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, from my lens at McKesson, um, and my view as, as a CEO that has some of this cost burden ourselves, some of the things that I think might be helpful to us as we, as we go forward. Clearly, uh, the biggest challenge we have, I think, both as employers and as citizens in this country is the condition of the raw material that we're handing to the manufacturing process in America. If you actually look at the healthcare systems in this country and compare them to the results other healthcare systems get, we do a pretty good job. If you compare the cost, we don't do such a great job. And, and clearly some of it is waste, some of it is, some of it is defensive medicine, but I would argue that the healthcare system itself is not necessarily fully to blame. It's the health of our population that bears a great deal of the responsibility. And for those of us that have a, a podium or a platform to talk or a policy making uh, opportunity, whether we run health plans or whether we're great employers, somehow we need to engage our population in taking individual responsibility for their own health. We can't lay the responsibility on the providers in this country to solve somebody's problem when their obesity epidemic started when they were five years old and they had diabetes by the time they were 10 and they were already in flight to a disastrous healthcare economic profile before they ever landed in the system formula, for, formally. So at McKesson, we've explored several ways to try to get our employees to be more engaged. It's not easy to do. Healthcare is not something that's a lot of fun to talk about, and certainly wellness is not a lot of fun. It means you have to get up and exercise. It means you have to pay attention to your health statistics. It means you have to be engaged somehow in it. And we found that just talking about it isn't, isn't enough. And I think that that's probably part of the solution for our country. We've tried to turn our employees into true consumers of health care so they can come to the decision making of their own health care in a way that's more informed, that's, uh, that's perhaps better directed from an economic perspective on the best interests of the company and themselves simultaneously. And just through some experimentation over the last four or five years by requesting that our employees get more involved in their own health care and incentivizing them to do that by supporting their premiums and doing other things that we can do to get them engaged, uh, we found a, a marked difference in their own interest. Our distribution center employees now have contests with each other of how many steps they can have in a day through the Fitbit step meters we've given to them. They compete with family members. They're engaged in the process of earning points in the company so they can get discounts on not only their health care but also go to the catalogs to to purchase prizes when they accomplish certain objectives. And through that engagement and through the economic incentives we put in place for our employees, we've been able to take our annual increases from an insurance premium perspective from 4.5% to 7.5% down to the, a run rate of about 1% over the last four or five years. A significant difference. And getting them to engage in the process is part of the, of the puzzle. The other part of the puzzle is to give them some kind of transparency into the decisions that they're making. So usually when you talk to people about consumerism and health care, you'll get a response back that says our population either isn't smart enough or isn't engaged enough to make decisions about their own health care. And our own experience is regardless of the, of the level of education that our employee populations have, they're interested in their health care and they're interested in, in their own economic situation. And if we can provide them with a tool set that helps them make better decisions uh, up front, uh, uh, we will we'll benefit economically and they'll benefit both from an economic and a quality of care perspective. So part of the solution here from my perspective is getting employees and patients in this country engaged in the process. Part of the solution is driving that engagement through economic motives. And the last part of the puzzle is to provide transparency around the cost and quality of the various decisions they might make so they can reform the health care system one patient, one person at a time. So as much as I'm optimistic about the quality of the healthcare system that we're all headed into as we age, I'm not as optimistic about the health policy around making it economically affordable for the individual or for our country. I'm also not a big reform person. I, I think it's difficult to, to mandate anything on a nationwide basis or even a statewide basis that is going to be completely laid out exactly the way it needs to be. 
And so my view through the lens that I have, uh, coming from McKesson and being on the supplier side of this, whether it's information technology or pharmaceuticals or medical surgical products, the increment approach of having our customers every day demand more, demand better, demand cheaper, is the kind of fuel that we need to put into the healthcare system and make sure that the buyers, the demanders of our healthcare system are not disengaged the way they are today from a cost and quality perspective. And that the providers, as we go through these evolutions, are more incented uh, on the outcome or, or delivery side, the result side of the care process, as opposed to incented on a volume uh, side, which is where, where we have been for so long, being paid for services as opposed to paid for results. But these transitions are not easy. Many of the people in this room are facing these significant challenges, whether they're health plans trying to find a way to partner with providers to take on some of that risk, or whether they're providers that are taking the risk on their own, perhaps without the data about the populations that they're going to try to cover. In both of those settings, they'd be much better off if they have an engaged patient as a partner in this that can help them make decisions going forward. So as you think about your own companies and you go back to your business world, think about how you can engage your employees in their own health economically and philosophically through transparency and through an economic sh sharing program of some type. And as you have an opportunity to debate health care in our country, either from a public policy perspective, which many of you are involved in, or simply from a discussion like you have in these rooms and these receptions, think about how this industry is the biggest and most important industry in our country. We are all going to be affected by this industry. Whether we like it or not, we are going to go into it. We are building our future in front of us. And those of us that are older and balding are going to land there first. We should try to make it the best we can possibly make it. And I would argue the best way to make this industry improve is to have that increment of the consumer constantly forcing evolution and revolutions in our healthcare system, one patient at a time, making those demands. And it's only going to be made possible with policy, both company policy and public policy uh, helps those consumers become informed and impassioned about their own care and taking responsibility for their economics. So this has been a real privilege for me to spend some time with you. And I'm hoping that I'll have an opportunity to learn through our Q&A session. And I guess, Warren, I'd be happy to turn that, that button on now if you'd like. So we can talk about Boston sports. <laughs> I, I, I lived in, uh, in uh, Westwood, Mass. until 1996 when I moved to California. And now I'm a California sports fan. But I don't admit it when I'm in groups like this. <laughs> I have two kids at Boston College. We can talk about Boston College, a great school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Eagles. We saw them beat USC the other day. We have a question up here in the front. If we can get a microphone over to her. Thank you. Years ago, when I was the uh, only non-smoker in my department, I was asked to cover the phones while the smokers went out. <laughs> and after about a month of this, I was more than annoyed. So I did the math, and I was like, X number of smoking breaks times X number of minutes times X number of time. I want an extra week of vacation. Do you think an idea like that would ever resonate or catch on to help people, one, stop smoking, and also two or two spots? I, I do think it will make a difference. It certainly would help in productivity, to your point, and have people in the building and working. You know, there are some privacy and legal barriers that sometimes get in the way with us making uh, decisions like that that could be seen as discriminatory. But at McKesson, we've been able to build health plan incentives uh, that our employees have the ability to voluntarily fill out forms that talk about whether they smoke or they don't smoke. And if they don't smoke, uh, we can verify that through a voluntary cheek swab and they get a benefit in their, in their insurance rates as a result of, of taking that initiative. If they don't want to tell us, then we won't inspect it, but they won't get the discount. So I think those are the kinds of, of moves that we, that we certainly can make. And, and as important, covering things like uh, smoking cessation at 100%, which we do, if you, if you want to quit and you raise your hand, we'll, we'll pay for all of it to try to help you get to the right physician and the right, uh, the right procedure to, to drop that, uh, that habit. So I, I think you raise a very good point. And I, we, we can do something about it. Those of us that control the dollars have the ability to do something about it. Yes, over there. Yeah, I've seen some innovations along the line of Can you grab that? That's okay. Thank you. I, um, I've seen some innovations along the, the, the lines of healthcare, both in, in how they're implementing um, insurance and, and the relationships with hospitals, and I've also seen it in technology. 
when companies are, you know, I guess three things. Is it who? Is this on your top three list? This management of healthcare. Who is it in the company that would be most receptive to learning about these things? And I guess that's just good. And if you leave those, where is the country? Where do people talk, talk to the company about these innovations? Well, I. I, I I think it's talked about all the time by us. And we, I actually feel a great responsibility to the employees at McKesson, and we try to build a, a culture that they know that, that we respect them for what they do and the contribution they make to our company, that I, I have an important job, but they have an important job as well, and we have to all contribute. And on the other end of what, whatever we do every day is a patient. So if you're picking a box in a warehouse and, and, and you don't personalize it to the fact that, that that box the next morning could be saving a baby's life, um, you're not gonna engage as much as you would if you actually take it seriously. So we've, we've been at this for a while and, and over the 180 years developed, I think, a good sense of how we can do that. But the second step is the employee actually thinking that you care about them. And so I, I think the, 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 the trick here, back to the smoking discussion, is, is we actually, we, we, don't, we don't penalize those people who have bad health behaviors. We reward those who have good health behaviors. And then we talk about it. Uh, and we post, uh, uh, these buildings have, have contests with each other. The total number of steps, this department against that department, they have walkathons, they have all kinds of things to get people up and out of their chairs. But I would say that the thing that was missing in the past that we've now put in place are the economic motives. So people have some self-interest in this. But these folks, um, I, I, for people in this room, I don't think we have an appreciation for how difficult it is to afford even a health care premium. That, that even if a company provides 90% of the fees for it, it's still an extremely high expense. And so to the extent that they see us in partnering with them to reduce their health risks and their exposure, I think it, it builds a, b a bunch of loyalty. The, the people that actually construct and build these things are uh, usually through the Human Resources Department. That's who I would task at McKesson to do it. And remarkably, there's all kinds of innovation going on now where you can buy the stuff off the shelf. So there are a lot of companies that will provide the incentive plans. There are a lot of technology companies that, that are, are connected to those online worlds and communities. So we can build an online world for our employees to talk with each other about their own wellness. That, that, those are the kinds of things that we've been doing. But I think that, that the flip for us is when we put an economic motive in place. That, that made a big difference. I've got a question in the back of the room, and then I'll go over to here after that one's done. We uh, interviewed and surveyed thousands of physicians every year. We have done so for 20 years. And we are getting spontaneous, unrequested comment from them in the last few years that signals a profound discouragement on their part. A recent survey we read said that 37% of physicians would do it. 37% would not be physicians again, is that what you said? 37% would be physicians. Out of, out of the 100. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if, if uh, you think they should be discouraged. Uh, if not, what do you say to them? I would be discouraged. And, and the reason I say that is that if you think about the artifact of what we've done with our most important industry is we've We've, we've created so much interventions in this market of called healthcare that th there's no way to navigate to a place that rewards you for quality, rewards you for productivity, rewards you for anything. The health plans now have a restriction on how much profit they can make. Now what other industry in our country has got a profit goal established that you can't go past by the federal government? So the more efficient I get as a, as a health plan, the, I'm more, the more I have to give back to my consumers in the middle of this as opposed to maybe we should have the health plans compete with each other in open markets that are transparent where our employees can go on the line or our, you know, anybody can shop for whatever they want to shop and I'll pick the partner that's the best for me. The same thing in the physician world. When we, when we go away from a market-based pricing regime and we end up with a reimbursement that's set by a regulator, you, you end up with those kinds of distortions. So the, the, the people that want to take care of our most vulnerable populations are the ones that are least rewarded. The ones that are most rewarded are the ones that set up concierge medicine practices for all of the people in this room, charge you 10 grand a year and let you call them on their home phone or on their cell phone 24 seven. Well, what does that do for the people that are on Medicare and Medicaid? Those people are gonna be stuck in lines. That's, that's not the way our society should work. 
And I understand that it's not affordable, that we, we've got to manage cost in our country somehow, but, but having the regulators do it arbitrarily with, uh, with, with the pen, from my perspective, has no basis in, in any kind of reality. And I'm not rewarded for being a great doctor or taking care of, uh, of the people. I'm, I'm rewarded the same way as the person down the street that doesn't have the same quality. So there's not a simple answer here, but just think about Medicare. I've, I've worked with my insurance company my whole career. They've been partners of mine, and suddenly when I turn 65, I'm a board of the state. Why can't I keep Tufts Health Plan through, through the, my next 40 years of life? Why can't they be incented along with me to keep me alive so that I can continue to pay my premiums and they can continue to benefit from my longevity? Why isn't that a solution that anybody's you know, really willing to talk about? And when you go into the ward of the state, the reimbursement for the providers you pick has been decided upon by the state, as opposed to decided upon by the health plan or by you, as opposed to me saying, I love my doctor, I'm gonna find a health plan who has my doctor, and my, my doctor's happy to work with that health plan, as opposed to walking in the doctor's office and finding that you just got a letter that says we're no longer taking Medicare or Medicaid patients. That, that's where we're headed. And I think that's the tragedy really behind why, why we're losing great professionals. Yes, in the back here. John, should you explain why the cost of my Lipitor is different from branded to generic, branded to generic, to uh, Walgreens, to Costco, to offshore purchase? There are five different prices. Well, that, part of that is the market, but, but I, I, I think it's a good question. The beginning of that question for the people that didn't have a chance to hear it was, why is my Lipitor price so different between a branded Lipitor, various generics dispensed in various venues, and then what I might be able to find in Mexico or someplace else? Well, some of the world does pharmaceutical pricing by price controls. Uh, so you could go into Europe, for example, and find a branded drug priced 10 different ways. Once again, artificially set by a regulator who decides what the branded Lipitor should cost. And in some of those markets, products aren't even launched because they're too expensive and the citizens of those countries will never get access to those products. And in other, others of those markets, the supply will be significantly reduced because the manufacturer will sell the product in a marketplace where they get a higher reward from a sales and margin perspective. So there's a tremendous amount of research and development in great towns like Boston with great healthcare systems like we have in Boston to create these products. And these manufacturers are rewarded to take this risk from a development perspective through the use of of patents, and they're given those patents, and our society has determined that if I innovate, I'm going to get a certain amount of time to recoup my profit. So that's why the patented companies are able to charge, quote unquote, whatever they want during that patent period. Now that could be a societal question if we wanted to say that patents should be reduced, they should only be 10 years or 3 years or whatever, and you'll have a commensurate reduction in R&D as a result of the patent life being reduced because companies will say, I can't get a return in 3 years and it's going to go generic and I'm going to get wiped out. That's why you have Savaldi costing $100,000 per patient because there wasn't a big enough patient population to warrant a lower price, plus the alternative care is much more expensive if you actually do a, a, a liver transplants in the middle of this whole thing, uh, and, and because there's no competition yet. So the issue of patents and competition at the branded level is what causes the, the branded prices to be where they are. And, and I just want to make it clear, McKesson is a pharmaceutical company by distribution only. We're, we're, not a, we're not smart enough to be innovators. We just move the stuff around. Um, and on the generic side, it really is market-based. So you know, the, the g generic companies uh, approach people like McKesson uh, or the retailers, like a Walmart, and they would say, you know, here's our deal, and those companies will pick whatever product they want to pick, hopefully based on the quality and the, and the price and the availability. And then what they choose to make from a margin perspective out to the marketplace to all of you is market-based. So you know, Walmart was really big with a launch of $4 generics, and the, the Rite Aid down the street could determine whether they wanted to match it or they didn't want to match it. But the branded part, part is the most confusing usually for people, is that it's, not, it's a patented product, and, and that way it's not, it's not market-based. And I would just provide one final warning for those of you that are tempted to go online and buy from overseas sources through mail order. Uh, that's, that process of getting those drugs is extremely risky and it's not controlled by anyone. And so my advice to you would be to buy domestically and go to places that have a, have a, a brand name or a neighborhood pharmacy and, and trust that the supply chain here is a lot safer. But thank you for that question over here. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Oh, it's <laughs> gracing, thank you. That's what I say to Wayne all the time when he shows up at my board meetings. Yeah, thank you for your <laughs> service. Um, I serve on the board of a local community health center here in Boston. 
And uh, I have been told that 85% of all visits to physicians could be resolved by services provided by a nurse practitioner. Uh, that would obviously squeeze the cost of healthcare, I think, down considerably. Um, is that uh, a question or a statement that's, uh, to your knowledge, accurate? And do you see the future of healthcare in this country, particularly in urban areas, being served by community health centers? Thank you. Well, that's a great question, and it's way outside of my purview of, of expertise. What, what I would say in answer to that is that, sort of back to my discussion about regulations in this country that might have been well intended 60 years ago, but like a lot of regulations, they don't get changed or revisited. So you know, like it's, I can say to whether if a physician needs to be involved or a nurse can do it or a nurse practitioner or whether a pharmacist can perform a service or whether we could just go online and do a lot of the stuff ourselves, behind the scenes are a set of regulations or societal norms that are set up by these various licensing bodies that exist. It's sort of like, you know, what, what lawyers can do and what non-lawyers can do or paralegals are allowed to do. So there are regulations that affect all of that. I think to the extent that, that, that we have demand that outstrips physicians' ability to have the capacity, some of these questions are going to have to be asked again. Uh, and you see the emergence of, of uh, minute clinics uh, and urgent care centers, all kinds of markets that are facilitating care in a way that we wouldn't have uh, dreamt two or three years ago. And on that, on that subject, I guess I would, I would make one additional comment. You know, the government has done a great job of incentivizing people to bring technology in to make them more productive. And even before the Affordable Care Act, there was a, a provision that, that the administration supported to allow uh, financing to, to go into the industry for people to buy technology. So whether they're physicians or hospitals, funding for the electronic medical records that people thought would be the magic behind reducing errors and improving efficiency and reducing the variability in the way the care has been delivered. We've gone a long way to automating the healthcare system in this country but we still are woeful in our ability to connect these systems together so that people have the necessary information when they're making a clinical decision or the necessary information when they're making a clinical decision that involves financial risk for them. It's not apparent all the time the condition of the patient coming in and where the medical records are. But the industry has recently pulled together to try to make it easier. Companies like McKesson and others are setting standards where all of our competitors can act together through a thing called Commonwealth Health Alliance. And those standard setting bodies that, that we're taking responsibility for, I think, will open up these valves of information and data so that it will flow more easily. And not the least of which is flowing to the consumer, getting that consumer engaged so that they know they have alternatives and they understand the economic impact of the choices they make. So if they pick the $10,000 HIP versus the $3,000 HIP, uh, they'll, they'll understand it before they make the decision. And if we develop the right health plans, we'll incentivize them to pick the $3,000 HIP provider as long as we have the same quality ratings for those two choices. You're welcome. Other questions? There's one right here in the middle. Thank you for your comments on how you provide incentives for your employees to practice healthy behaviors. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how we incentivize doctors to go into the areas that are most needed, like internists and pediatricians, as distinct from dermatologists or um, other specialties, and also how we incentivize doctors to go to places in the country where they're most needed. I think that's a great question. I, I, I think a large part of the issue resides with the economics associated with getting a, a degree as a physician to begin with, uh, and then finding a way to get a return on that investment. And so many of the specialties have, to, you, to your point, dermatology and others, uh, have a better economic future than the alternative might have. And that economic future might be built around patients that are, are self-payers or cash payers or insured versus a larger Medicaid or Medicare population, which they have to serve. And those populations, because of the reimbursement mechanisms we've, we've put on them, don't reward the physician as much for that time and, and, and energy. The rural community settings, I think, are also a challenge. And part of its volume, part of its lifestyle, uh, people don't want to live in some of those markets. And so I think, once again, incentives and economics would play a role in helping people go to those markets. I, I do think it's a shame, though, that we have um, the people who want to give the most suffer the most themselves for that giving from an economic perspective. And we need to find a way to solve that. Yes? There's going to be a microphone right there. I really, I really don't intend for this to be a shameless self-promotion, but I just want to mention that one of the new organizations that was mentioned 
joining today, the Craft Center for Community Health. Our mission is to encourage young docs to practice in community health centers through a program that not only incents them, but all by loan repayment, it provides leadership development and opportunities to expand their careers beyond the hamster wheel of seeing patients in, in community health centers, which is a very stressful, challenging um, career. So, um, and, and several, actually several members of our leadership council are in the room today, and I just want to say thank you. Well, congratulations for doing that important work. It's going to make a difference. Other questions? There's one over here in the back. Hang on one second. The lady in the red dress is going to get you a microphone. Given the fact that uh, Massachusetts uh, gave birth to Romney Care, which gave birth to Obamacare, we know this is not a political issue. So, given the fact that you have, in Massachusetts, Given that you uh, spoke admirably of our statistics uh, and your national perspective, one wonders why other states would not be equally proud to serve if they achieve those same kinds of statistics. What is the objection to the Affordable Care Act in those states? Well, I'm not a politician and I'm not an expert on those states. I can tell you that the, the uh, Massachusetts success has certainly been on the enrollment side or the access side. I should say the coverage side. I'm not a student enough to know whether there's actually access behind the coverage, whether the lines to get a GP uh, or, or actually seeing a specialist, whether it's been made easier or more complex because of people being in the system. But at least more people are in the system. But there's a couple of other dimensions. Are they in the system in a way that actually gives them the care that they want at the quality level they want at a level that's affordable for the residents of Massachusetts from a taxpayer perspective? And I think that's what people are grappling with. I, I, as I travel around the world, there are very few people that say we ought to find a way to provide high quality health care to everyone that needs it. The question becomes, all right, who, who's going to pay for it? And as you, as you uh, parse that question a little bit more, it's like, well, I, I don't want to pay, I don't want to pay for sloppy health care. I don't want to pay for people who can already pay for it themselves. So everybody's got to be in the pool and participate, which are some of the provisions certainly in you know, Obamacare and Romney care. Um, but it, it's a little bit more complex than that. And I, I think you should be proud of the access uh, work that you've done here. I, I guess the, que the question remains to be seen whether the access is actually producing better, better health outcomes at a lower price. That's the ultimate objective we should have as a, as a society. It, we, we just can't afford the, the path we're on. And I think the Affordable Care Act as well as what's happened here in Massachusetts are good steps. We had to have a lot of, ex we had to have 50 experiments going on, and we should be learning from those experiments as we go forward. And, and like I said before, I think one of the things I'd like to do is get, get the, uh, the rationing for health care shouldn't be uh, state politicians and it shouldn't be federal politicians. I'm not sure it should be employers, and I'm not sure it should be payers. Ultimately, what it should be is the consumer of the health care themselves. They've got to make a decision to ration their own care when the economics fall outside the boundaries that they're comfortable with. And for those parts of our society that have the most need, we should be providing them with the safety net, but that safety net shouldn't be all health care free. That safety net should provide some provisions so there's economic skin in the game for even the lowest part of our society from an economic perspective to be interested in the economic choices that they make. And the argument you'll get sometimes, well, they're eighth grade, average eighth grade education, so they're not smart enough to make those choices. Well. You know, I, I've seen what's happened in other industries, and, and even those people who quote unquote aren't smart enough find a way to figure out the best solution. And people stopped buying American cars when the quality uh, became dismal and went to Toyota. It wasn't just the college kids that went to Toyota, it was everybody went to Toyota. And what, that, what did that do? It forced Ford and others to get their act together from a quality perspective and get their share back. I, I think the same phenomenon would happen in, in healthcare. But we've mixed the two debates together. We, we've mixed access and quality and affordability and economics all together into this kludgied mess, and, and we've taken the, the payment mechanisms and blended them in as well, and then we end up on both sides of the aisle arguing that, well, we can't afford it, we can't give it to them, and, that, and that's, not, that's not a productive discussion. Who wants to see people in misery that can't afford their health care? And, and on the other side of the aisle, we have people pointing at the others saying, well, you don't understand what it's like to be where I am in society. So we've got to have a, an adult conversation. But the path, the path we're on 
is just not going to work. It's impossible. It just is not going to work. We, in this Medicare population, as it continues to grow at 10,000 people a day, we are going to face a tsunami. And this administration tried to get in front of it. There will be other administrations that try to get in front of it. But if we consign this to the politicians in America who have lots of different challenges that they have to face, let alone the issue of dealing with constituents and getting reelected all of the time, we're, we're going to end up in a real big problem as a nation. We, we've got to bring it back to the people of our country, get them economically aligned with the, with, the, with the reality of where we sit, give them the knowledge and the transparency around their health choices so they can make good decisions. The big employers need to put systems in place to make that happen. The big payers need to, need to make that transparency happen, and we need to support our society in a way that's productive over time. I have to thank you for your time and attention today. It's been a real privilege to be here. I want to thank Boston College and Warren. And Wayne Budden, thank you very much.